Hello my friends and welcome to Fishery. I'm Alexander Williamson and I'm not like other fish channels. So let's start this off by saying that we're going to be talking about my 10 favorite little hacks, tips, tricks on getting fish to spawn. There are lots of ways to get fish to spawn. There's general principles and thoughts and systems of, you know, having grow out areas and we're not getting into that. We're getting into the actual mechanism of what triggers them to spawn. Sometimes it's weird stuff. I mean, Barry White, Kenny G, you name it. No, we're not going there. We're, we're, st we're sticking with scientific stuff. But let me show you just one little example of this before we start the countdown. So say you've got some eggs, maybe some rainbow fish, something that takes a few weeks uh, to hatch and you're watching them you're watching them and most of them hatch and you still have a few left some of them are starting to fungus up look foggy and white and you're like come on little guys i can see your eyes and your spinal cord and i can see you moving around in there but they're just not hatching so what do you do well you grab one of those test tubes preferably one you've never used for reagents but api test kits come with these you can get test tubes other places as well and you take the eggs you put it in the tube with a little bit of water just a little bit then you take the top off gently put it on so that nothing's coming out and then you simply submerge it into your deepest tank whatever your deepest aquarium is hopefully it's like two feet deep you know a 75 gallon or something even a 40 breeders enough to put a little pressure in there and then you close it back up at the very bottom of the tank that puts pressure into the little vessel and then you can just put it in your back pocket it's got a little pressure in it and the jostling of you walking around with those eggs will then cause them to open uh, probably within six hours. So just don't sit down or forget about the glass vial in your back pocket. Now I want to say thanks to Gary Lang for t telling the Seattle Club that trick years ago, uh, but I've used it and it's a great one. So if you're into that kind of stuff, these little tips and tricks, let's count them down right now, starting at number 10. All right, coming in at number 10, we have feed your baby fish before they are born. Now, what does that mean? It sounds kind of weird, but of course we need to feed the adults because in fish, they are created in eggs. And that egg has a yolk sac or an umbilical cord in some cases. Fish, overwhelmingly, it's going to be a yolk sac. And that yolk sac feeds the baby fish and the fry throughout their first few days, whether that's in the egg or it's in the egg and then they carry it for another two to five days outside the egg. But it is so crucial to get all the minerals, protein, and important nutritional value in there via the mother. And so it is really important, especially two weeks prior to when you think that you'll be doing the spawning or putting fish together. Some people split up the males and females, some leave them together, but it's crucial to get them to eat as much protein as possible. And feeding them live cultures like uh, brine shrimp and other things like this is one really good way to get their instincts going so that they get that hunting instinct and that foraging instinct and they will pack on a whole lot more weight and a whole lot more nutrients pound for pound while doing so. Number nine on our list is going to be feed the baby fish before they are born. Didn't I just say that? Well, yes, but differently this time. The parents are not no dummies. They know that baby fish need to have food ready once their yolk sacs run out of energy. And evolutionarily, they know that in the water there need to be microorganisms depending on the size of the fish. Sometimes that's single cell organisms like paramecium and infusoria. Other times it's more complex things like little nematodes or worms, uh, you know, larvae from different uh, insects, things like blood worms or white worms or walter worms. Whatever it may be, research what is appropriate for your fish. And before the fish are even born, in those two weeks of conditioning, also add some of those things. Even if the parents don't eat them, they need to see that, yes, my babies have food. And this will also encourage the females instinctually to pack on more weight or to basically put away more protein because it appears that it's worth all of her caloric efforts and energies evolutionarily to fatten up as much as possible, have as many eggs as possible, and this is no time to wait for a better time. Now, if things are scarce, she may have half as many eggs, and she may kind of hedge her bets, evolutionarily speaking, and have another brood later in the year, or maybe two in a season, or maybe just not so many that season, and she'll use the energy herself 
in order to keep going and hopefully next year will be better. So make sure that there is lots of little live single cell organisms. Green water is great. Infusoria is great. But this really helps with nano fish like micro rasboras and small tetras where the babies are super tiny and they will be grazing and foraging within three or four days of hatching. They'll be out and on their own swimming and not just hanging out stuck to a leaf somewhere. All right. Number eight, we have spawning partners. Another one that's a little outside the box for some people, but this one is the idea that fish create chemicals, right? Just like us, they have pheromones, they have uh, different chemicals, but both good and bad, whether that's waste material that didn't get metabolized and later snails and shrimp are going to sort through that waste and they're going to use some of it and then some of it's going to turn into soil or mulm or whether that is stuff that is not good for the tank, like things that eventually break down into ammonia or nitrates. But no matter what it is, these spawning partners affect the water chemistry. And if we are in a system that's a closed system, it can really affect the water chemistry. So in places like the Amazon or in flooded forests of Southeast Asia, when one species starts spawning a certain time of year, a lot of times it changes the actual makeup of the water chemistry. There's all of a sudden an influx of progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, all these different chemicals that are associated with life, reproduction, and mating. And it's been noted many, many times, and going back into the 1930s, that when one creature spawns in the aquarium, it is very likely for another set of species to also spawn. So this may be Corydoras in with your angelfish, or pencilfish in with your Corydoras. But the fact that you get one fish that lives in a similar habitat spawning, and you have other fish in that tank, oftentimes will trigger them to get into that mood. Number seven in triggering new spawning is going to be provide a habitat that is good for all those things we just discussed. So all those microorganisms, all the little types of single cell organisms and algae, they need things. Over 20% of the plant material in a creek or in a lake is eaten by fungi. And fungi is part of biofilm and aufuchs, which I have whole episodes on. But they're these intertangled networks of biofilms, proteins, protozoas, nematodes, trematodes, you name it, all the little critters that get eaten. And it turns out that a lot of the nutrients in those trophic levels then get taken into insects and, and simple-celled organisms, and these go into the fish, and often times they make up as much as 50 or 60 percent of the diet of those adult fish, which is how they're going to pack on the weight in nature. So you don't need to always focus on this. You could just feed them artificial food. But if you're going with a natural spawning uh, method and you want to recreate nature, get those natural instincts going in species that seem to be really tricky to spawn, it will really help to have an environment that is ready for this. Having broken down leaves will affect the pH, the tannins, which in turn all impacts the fish's autoimmune system in a very positive way if it's a species that comes from these environments. All right, number six is real simple, darkness versus light. Sometimes it's the length of the day and how much dark versus how much light there is. That's as simple as this one is. I can't tell you what that amount is, but there are many fish like rasboras that are known to live in a few inches of water down at the bottom of the forest floor where only something like 2 to 5% of the natural UV light makes it down past the trees and into the valleys and ravines. And due to this, they don't want light blaring on them. And even some of the eggs and early juvenile fish may have a sensitivity to UV where it can damage their development. Number five on our list is going to be pressure. Do, 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 pressure. No, no, no Billy Joel fans here. All right. Well, number five is all about barometric pressure and water pressure. So that means changing how much water is in the tank as well as how much pressure is in the atmosphere above the tank. Millibars is how we measure pressure. And before a storm, we may see a shift from a thousand millibars down to say 900 millibars. And whenever a cold front comes in or whenever a big thunderstorm moves into a region, or even maybe just a big rainstorm, we usually see a drop in the millibars. It sounds a little crazy, but you can open up your window and your room will become the same pressure as outside. And if you know that shift is coming in the afternoon or something, why not let that pressure change impact your fish? Then you can give it an extra boost 
by getting water that's just a teeny bit cooler because rain is a little cooler than the water in the jungle floor. And you can add water back to a tank that wasn't all the way full. And this is what we call faking out the rain cycle. And this will add a little more water pressure as well. You can even put a little power head on if these fish are used to spawning in creeks that become overflowing with water and they move from a flooded jungle habitat into, say, creeks, rivers, and lakes. And it is the monsoon season that triggers that. Yet again, research is your best friend and will help you figure out what setup to do. Now, number four is really simple. Mix up the tank. Sometimes your fish are just bored. Their fish, you know, in the wild, they have a whole lot to look at. They scavenge things, they uh, forage, they kind of look under things. Some of them dig around, you know, it just depends on the species. But some fish just need that extra oomph of kind of reorganizing, especially cichlids. They want to make a place their home, and sometimes they kind of get stuck in a rut. So if you take the fish out, put them in a bucket, rearrange their tank, and then plop them back in, that is sometimes the best thing you can do to get them to spawn. All right, we're on to number three, big three, dither fish. So we already talked about this a little bit, but we're going to talk about it in a different way. And that is your fish may not be spawning because they're nervous. You know, you don't want to go tap on the glass and spy on them all the time. That's not what you want to do when you're with your intimate ones, is it? Well, in any case, fish are in extra heightened awareness when they're going through this. They don't want to get eaten in the heat of the moment. And because of this, uh, they look for cues in their environment. And one of the biggest cues is what are the other fish around them naturally doing? So whatever other fish they've gotten used to, oftentimes those other fish especially if it's a fish that's spawning on the bottom of the tank, something like a crebensis or something like a pleco, they actually take cues for how much the fish above are swimming around up at the top of the water. If they see that the fish are up above and those little fish, you know, inch or two inch long fish are just doing their thing, ignoring the, the life going on around them, but they're present and calm, that's a good indicator that there's no predator right above about to zoom in and eat them or disturb their spawning. And it varies with each species, but you know, things like pencil fish, even things like little guppies uh, are a great way to kind of keep things calm. Just make sure that they're not going to eat the eggs or the baby fish before you can move them. All right. Now, number two is going to be the chemistry of the water, which we touched on briefly. But the TDS, the total dissolved solids, the pH, the temperature, all of that stuff, which you, I'm sure you know is important. That can make a huge difference. And again, faking out the wet season, we do by oftentimes letting things evaporate off for two, three, four weeks and letting that water level go down lower than the rim of the tank a few inches. And then it gets warm. That emulates the dry season when it's not raining. And when the water's getting stagnant and the leaves are getting broken down in the aquarium, in the tank. And what this will do is it will leach out the tannins and the nitric, the humic, and the carbonic acid that is in organic materials, and it will actually cause the water to drop in its uh, pH or rise in its acidity. Depending on the fish you have, it either wants neutral or acidic or alkaline waters, and also your TDS, which you can control with things like crushed coral or activated charcoal or carbon if you're trying to get certain things out of the water. Even chemical triggers that are left over from not cleaning your tank, like nitrates, nitrites, these are things that can lead to stress in your fish over time and can tax their immune system. And I'm grouping all these chemical things, which could be several episodes in their own, as things you need to manage. So check out some of my other long form episodes on, you know, are nitrates really that dangerous? And, you know, what do your plants need from nitrates versus your fish? All these sorts of things, as well as TDS, KH, GH, and all the roles they play in the aquarium. Lastly, at number one, the social presence of the fish that are being spawned. And as the great sages in time, the philosophers and poets, Shakespeare, the Greeks, the Ayurvedic texts tell us, love is not as simple as one or two individuals getting together. Sometimes it gets messy. Sometimes there's three. Sometimes there's four. Sometimes it's a triad or a colony or a dodecahedron of love. And in the fish world, sometimes it's billions of individuals. Sometimes we don't even know why they all get together, like in the case of eels out in the Pacific Ocean, which magically meet up together every year and a half or two years, spawn there, and then move literally halfway around the Earth back into freshwater regions. But the important part here is that depending on the species you're spawning, understand the dynamics that are best at play. 
if it's Tetris or something, or Celestial Pearl Danios, maybe you want to have five or six in a breeding tank. Maybe you don't want any tank mates with them. And literally removing the tank mates or reducing the size of the shoal or increasing the size of your shoal can really trigger the behavior that leads to spawning. Combine that with these other steps, these other crucial steps that we've listed out, and it can be the magical key that you turn and unlock, and all of a sudden you've got lots and lots of eggs. It can mean the difference between one female dropping two or three eggs here and there for maybe two or three days, to a female dropping five, ten eggs each day for a week with all the other females in the group doing the same. What unlocks that? Well, yet again, I hate to tell you, it's different for every species. That's part of the magic, part of the frustration, and part of the fun of spawning fish and getting to know the enigma of nature. Whoa, we made it to the end of the video, and uh, the, the, the baby fish are just about ready. Just don't look at them. No close-ups, no close-ups. They're all fine, all good. So, how'd you like that countdown? If you made it to the end, I, I take it you're still interested in what I'm saying, or maybe someone has kidnapped your phone. In that case, blink twice, no, I still can't do anything. But if you're enjoying the channel, you're enjoying the content, you want to be informed next time I have something dropping, subscribe, turn the alerts on, or just stop by the channel. You know, a lot of times that works way better than even subscribing. I don't even know why you subscribe anymore on YouTube. It's kind of a crazy system. But I want to thank all of you who made it this far, made it all the way through. You guys are champs. You guys make a difference. And all of you who stick around and are part of the community, I can't do this without you guys. So I really want to thank you sincerely for, for everything, for all your questions and all the cool stuff you teach me and share with me. It's awesome. I love this. I couldn't ask for a cooler job. So thank you for allowing me to do this. I will see you guys all next time on Fishery.